welcome to your favourite time of the week and mine, Weaving Hillsong. Thank you so much for joining us for another really interesting conversation with Nathan Zamprogno. The response to part one of A Bald Faced Lie has been tremendous and of course he gave some testimony pretty much there that because he addressed the very serious charges that are before the court at the moment and used the P word and he's going to use another P word which is which is politics. So Nathan's going to talk about how he ended up leaving Hillsong and it's very he had very different reasons and he had very different reasons but still very much the same as what you've heard so far in other episodes and that's because it, there comes a time when people who've been loyal to church principles for so long feel that they have to choose their own personal principles over that for whatever reason and that's what's happened with Nathan and it's one of the hardest if not the hardest decision someone can make in their whole life. At the end of this pod there'll be an edited version that Nathan has kindly gone through for you and me so that we don't have to listen to that full hour to give you an idea of Frank's capacity to preach or speak to a large crowd of people in 2004 shortly before he died. The full version is on the Leaving Hillsong Facebook page but let's continue on with more of Nathan Zampronio's story in part two of a bald-faced lie. Thank you so much to Nathan. Thank you so much to Nathan for choosing this show. Thank you so much to Nathan for choosing this show to talk about this very important topic. I asked him. I did ask him before we started the interview whether he was willing to have a knock on the door and he didn't flinch. And as I said to you before, and as I said last episode, there's so much more to Nathan than these two episodes could ever cover. So make sure you look him up. You spell Zamprogno, Z for the Americans, A-M-P-R-O-G-N-O. -O. He's been a social commentator on the intersection of faith and politics for many years, and I think you'll find him really interesting. You can find him on Facebook, and his website is counsellorzamprogno.info. Nathan's also worked at KIFS, as he discussed, and you can find them, the cult information, the cult information and family support network at kifs.org.au. Now, of course, if any of these episodes have been distressing to you especially some of that last especially with that content focusing on Frank last episode please reach out reach out to one of us or to somebody you trust and if you think that you have information that the police need to hear then of course make sure you report it to New South Wales Police I believe it's the Hills District Command that's running the case so get in touch with them if you need support to report to police, again, please reach out to one of us. Thank you again for joining us for this conversation. By this time next week, we should be talking about the new podcast we should be talking about the new podcast, Reading Hill Song, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So stay tuned. So stay tuned to social media, all those kind of places, and you'll see the news there. Thanks for all the support. 
and all your feedback. And we'll talk soon. All your feedback. Um, so the Frank Houston audio is now going to be attached. I've put a longer ending for the song, so hopefully you can switch off in time or pull over or whatever you need to do if you don't want to hear his voice. But here's an edited version of a 2004 speech that Frank Houston gave it at Maitland Church just months before he died. So now's kind of the time to change the channel or whatever you might want to do to avoid him. Thanks for all your support, all the messages and feedback. It's just so appreciated. Keep it coming, please. And we'll be talking soon. Bye. So you became really aware of how much status and influence started to mean during that time. It was profoundly wired into the DNA of the church that it was to have a national profile, that it would be influencing the course of the nation, and that it was a mark of God's plan as that our denomination would have you know, national influence. So when a succession of parliamentary figures like John Howard or Peter Costello or mm. Bob Carr would come to Hillsong Conference and stand there beside Brian Houston and thank the congregation for their support. It was like what Ronald Reagan used to say. He says, oh, look, um, I know that you can't endorse me, but I want you to know that I endorse you. It was kind of that, wow. that kind of coded mm. language. We know that Brian Houston and Scott Morrison have been close friends. Mm. Now that Brian Houston is being charged criminally, the only missive from the Prime Minister's office says, oh, well, you know, Brian Houston and Scott Morrison have only had very infrequent contact over the last year. So I can I can hear the backpedalling furiously. It sounds a lot like an AOG distancing. Like... You no, know, it's, it's, it's toxic. I mean, so for the church to be a leader in national issues, it had to move into politics. And Andrew Evans, who was a significant... Assemblies of God figure in South Australia mm -hmm. had started this political party called Family First. They'd had some success in South Australia in electing people to state parliament. And then in around 2004, it became a national thing. So the Family First Party was the political animal of the Australian Christian churches. And it had the imprimatur of Brian and Hillsong and the, the, the movement at a national level. And it was the political party of the Australian Christian churches. Now, they would be terribly cranky to hear somebody <laughs> assert that because they always tried to deny it. But, you know, name me Christian figures in other denominations that were, that were pioneering this or were standing as candidates in this. There was a woman who, sta who stood as the, as the lead Senate candidate in New South Wales for Family First in the 2004 federal election. She was the wife of the state president of the Australian Christian churches yeah, okay. and then induced 10 other people from our congregation to stand as cardboard cutout candidates in lower house seats at that federal election. People who had no political ambition and who d certainly didn't live in the electorates that they were standing as candidates for. And apparently there were 140 different lower house candidates standing for Family First, none of whom came within a bull's roar of ever being able to be elected. But it was leverage, because if you had those lower house candidates standing around the country, you might be able to engineer a preference deal to get your Senate candidate over the line. And let me tell you, in Victoria, that worked. Steve Fielding, the only federal parliamentarian to be elected under the Family First banner, stood for one very ignoble term and then went to a very well-deserved obscurity. In New South Wales, this particular woman got 0.6% uh, of the vote, which was less than the legalised marijuana party. <laughs> but you need to know that Family First had the strong backing of Hillsong. And uh, in 2004, when Brian Houston was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian, 
telling people that there was no organisational or financial connection to the Family First Party under the table, the financial development arm of the Australian Christian churches, whose board members were largely Hillsong appointees, were offering several hundred thousand dollars worth of money, either as a loan or as a gift, to the Family First Party to prosecute their 2004 election campaign. So... Where would that money have come from? This was money that the Australian Christian churches had put into a financial development arm so that pastors could get low interest loans to build you know buildings or that they could get a low interest mortgage on their manse or that they could get a you know taxation concession car or something like that it was it was a church development fund and that money was offered i don't know whether it was taken up but it was certainly offered from the assemblies of god or the acc to the family first party and when i read that in the paper i knew that that wasn't brian wasn't telling the truth the degree of leverage that was applied to congregations around the country was extraordinary and there's we've got proof of this i mean imagine you're sewn in and and you're a good congregant at, at an, uh, an australian christian church's church but you might hold a different political stripe in fact you might have been entitled to believe that you could vote for the liberal party or the labor party and that that wasn't ever taken as a a poor reflection on your commitment to the vision of that church or your obedience to your church leaders suddenly family first comes along and your congregation are being told that this is the Christian candidate and that you really ought to vote for this candidate and you should support this Christian candidate's campaign. And if you didn't, it reflected poorly on your teachability or on how devoted you were to the vision of that church. And there was audio of a minister down at an ACC church in Devonport, Tasmania, who told his congregation that if they didn't vote for the Family First candidate is that they would become an anger magnet for God. Can we insert that? Of course. You have no choices anymore because you belong to God. God owns you completely. You have no more rights. And so that vote that you get isn't a vote that's given to you by the government. It's not given to you by democracy. It's given to you by God to serve God with. I don't want you to be attra attracting God's anger in a couple of weeks time by electing people without consulting him. Suddenly, a party has sprung up. It's the Family First Party. And uh, Wayne is standing for the family, family First Party. And well done, Wayne. Congratulations. <laughs> Tomorrow night is the Meet the Candidates Forum. This year, we're having it right here in this church. You just come back here tomorrow night and we put bums on seats and we freak out the candidates. That's basically the, that's the game plan. That as a church leader, I can go to them and I can say, remember those 500 people that showed up on that night? Well, I represent them, and this is what they want. They don't want late-term abortion. They don't want the morning-after pill. They don't want homosexual marriage. They don't want homosexuals adopting little children who deserve a better chance in life. They don't want that. And if you don't cross the floor, or if you don't stand up for this and do something about it, you'll be gone in the next election. Friends, the commission that God gave to Adam, the command, he said, go forth and multiply and have dominion. God's purpose was for his people to have dominion. This is our purpose. This is what God has ordained for us. He's called us to influence, to dominion, to having authority, to having power. So there you are. To be told that the, that the Christian church should have dominion, that it should have power and authority. So this word dominion floats around a lot, and it also actually, when I mean, it relates to climate change and stuff as well. Well, what, Christian, what's Christ, dominion? Christian dominionism, boiled down, is a belief that if you really believe that you're enacting God's will, God's will has to be enacted in every facet of our society's life. We should have Christian legislators that those laws should reflect Christian mores or principles. It's like prosperity doctrine. If God's mark of approval on your life is that you become wealthy, then God's approval on your nation is that your legislators are largely Christian. Mm -hmm. and, and never mind that we live in a, a secular, pluralistic society where people are free to have any religious choice that they want or no religion at all, and that it's a strength of our society that we are so cosmopolitan and that our government is secular and that governments are separate from the church for a good reason and that if you entangle faith and politics too much it's 
bad for the state and it's bad for the churches too. And to keep them at arm's length is good for the health of both. Well, that's what we're supposed to be living. Yeah. So Family First failed. And then eventually... Failed in Parliament. They, they failed in Parliament. The, the party was dissolved in 2017. And it, it was absorbed into the Australian Conservatives, which was another pseudo-Christian right-wing party founded by Cory Bernardi, an ex-liberal. And then the Australian Conservatives uh, was dissolved in uh, June 2019 and, and no longer exists. I mean, I don't begrudge the presence of Christians in our legislatures. I've worked in the offices of a number of parliamentarians who were practising Christians, but they didn't wear it on their sleeve. And it wasn't the raison d'etre of their movement into politics. It was something that enriched and ennobled their deliberative role, whereas Family First seemed hell-bent on getting Christians into Parliament so that they could vote against same-sex marriage or vote against abortion or vote against euthanasia. And when those views are at odds with not only the broader society, but even the opinions of a majority of Christians, I mean, I can refer to statistics that show that not only is the majority of people in Australia, in favour of others having autonomy over their end-of-life decisions. If they've suffered from a, a, a fatal illness and they're on their last legs and they want some dignity in their last days, they deserve to have autonomy over the decisions that prevail. These people would be perfectly happy to take that autonomy away. Yeah. Yeah. And not only do, as a majority of Australians believe that, but a majority of Christians believe that. And yet it's always curious to me that our church leaders are prepared to assert that they speak for a majority of Australians and stand against that in the same way that they stood against same-sex marriage. And it's interesting after a couple of years to kind of return to the apocalyptic claims that were made about what introducing same-sex marriage would do to Australian society. As far as I can see, we're all still here and it hasn't spelt the end or diminished the dignity of any heterosexual marriage. And in fact, if you're involved in a heterosexual relationship and felt threatened by a same-sex a couple formalising their union, then it probably says more about you than it says about them. Yeah, it always does. I mean, that had quite an impact on you, that kind of political pressure. Well, I ended up leaving the fellowship that I'd been in since I was 15 over this issue. I felt it was an enormous betrayal of good-hearted people who had been in the church for decades when suddenly this misadventure into politics burned a lot of those people. And I've lost count of the number of people who left angry and bitter about that betrayal, this blurring of the line between faith and politics, based on the church's broader perception that, well, you know, if, if we're serious about believing that we're transforming Australia into the, what was it, the great south land of the Holy Spirit, is that that involves... a great song. It is indeed. And the thing is, you know, I've still got a lot of Jeff Bullock's songs as earworms in my head. I can still sing along to them. feel a little cringy about it now. Oh, it's fantastic. And the thing is, I've made a study, a lay study, of how people get caught up into these things. And all of the psychological cues and tricks that draw people in, the fact that your average praise song has the same tempo as the human heartbeat, and that, wow. and, and that the lights and the effects and the appeal to the heart that gets people to open their wallets and open their hearts have very, very well understood psychological cues. And I'm loath to use the word cult, but it's certainly cult-like. I've spoken to a number of ex-Australian Christian churches pastors. One recently said, you know, I can't believe that I, I gave my assent to that. It, it, it wasn't a cult, but it was certainly cult-like. And the experience that I've been through caused me to join an organisation. And I, for a time, I sat on the national committee of an organisation called KIFS, Cult Information and Family Support. And, th you know, they are an advocacy group that try to point out the predations of cults. And my role particularly is to have stronger laws against cults. I mean, why are there a thousand different denominations and charities, many of whom are under the Hillsong banner, who take taxation concession from the Australian taxpayer, but the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission don't impose an adequate public benefit 
test. Why is it that Hillsong was able to take so much money in JobKeeper and not pay it back? Why is it that Hillsong was able to get hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants ostensibly to benefit the Aboriginal community, only to find that four-fifths of that money was spent on their own staff and that only a couple of tiny grants ended up being made to actual needy Aboriginal organisations. And yet the grants continue to flow. Indeed they do, and they have particular grace and favour. And I always felt that when the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission was instituted, it was kind of half done, it was half baked. They were set up to try and provide a regulatory or accountability role to Australian churches and charities. And the Australian taxpayer had an entitlement that if you're conferred the privilege of taxation exemption, is that there is a manifest public good that's going to flow from that, that you're doing charitable work or you're doing work that the welfare system otherwise wouldn't be able to take up to provide practical help, whether it's employment services or food for the needy or shelter or whatever. And I don't doubt that many religious organisations deserve that taxation concession and do genuinely good work in the community. I'm sceptical about everything that Hillsong does satisfies that public benefit test and it's been unable through its legislative oversight and so forth to kind of do the remit that it was originally conceived to do because I think that most people think that it's wrong that a church that has an enormous and extremely profitable commercial side in music and media and publications effectively trades tax-free, doesn't pay a cent of tax, and that ministers have incredibly generous concessions in terms of their own personal taxation arrangements uh, and, and live very well indeed, whereas the rest of us think of it as a civic duty to pay our taxes because that's the common good that provides for the roads and the hospitals and so forth, and these people feel that they don't have to do that. So I think reform in that area is long overdue. Oh, we'll talk to anybody in small business and I'm sure they'll agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, again, charities are one thing, but if you're running a m massive international media empire, you've got to look at whether the, the foundations, the intent of people that set up that kind of taxation uh, concessions for charitable purposes really had that kind of thing in yeah, mind. I, think I don't that, think they did. They're quite archaic now across the board. I think all of those kinds of exemptions need a real review. Hillsong has a charity. That's mission is to promote Hillsong. I don't understand why they get tax exemption for that. Look, it, it goes back to the fact that years ago, there was an attempt at defining what a religion is. And if you meet this weak standard for a definition, you can apply for that kind of taxation exemption. There was a case decades ago where the Scientologists were knocked back by the Victorian state government. They wanted to be exempt from payroll tax. And the Victorian government said to the Scientologists, try it on, you're just a wacky cult, and denied them. It wended its way all the way up to the High Court. And the High Court tried and failed to grapple with the definition of what a religion was. And the High Court in 1983 ended up concluding that Charlot wait for it, I mean, this, this answer will depress you. They said that charlatanism is a necessary price of religious freedom. If a self-proclaimed teacher persuades others to believe in a religion, his lack of sincerity or integrity is not incompatible with the religious character of the belief, practices and observances accepted by his followers. In other words, you can say you're religious, you can say you're a Jedi or that you're a devotee of the flying spaghetti monster and under Australian law you should be eligible for the same kind of taxation concession and I think that's a betrayal of the spirit of that law. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long way away from the idea of helping, you know, the travelling pastor pay for a pillow for his night. The story that was always told in the church is that, you know, people used to be so seer in their compassion to, you know, the missionaries and, and ministers of religion ran such a tight ship as that there'd be a drive in a church to send them used tea bag. And like, you know, we are well beyond that because if Brian Houston lives in a mansion and received a great big Harley Davidson motorcycle as a gift on the stage, and particularly, you know, the, those people that are part of the prosperity doctrine movement that Brian was part of and the Americans even more so, 
wear their affluence as a badge of honour. The Benny Hins, the Joel Osteens, and Australians, I think, are particularly instinctively repelled by that. We yeah. don't we don't buy into that. So the Australian permutation of that through Hillsong and its prosperity doctrine, I think, strikes many people in Australia as very distasteful. I've noticed that difference too. So the Australian media have been cynical from the word go. I think Australians generally are fairly cynical yeah. about religion. And it's not as though we're ardently atheist like the French national character is. There's a word in French, it's a laicite. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. And it's a kind of institutionalised secularism that has to pervade every facet of French culture and governance. Australia doesn't have that. Mm. We have a clause in our national constitution that says that church and state should be separate. And it was modelled after a similar clause in the American constitution. But in every other respect, we've muddied the waters terribly. Robert Menzies opened the door to giving government money to religious schools, where now an enormous proportion of our schooling system is religiously based education now. And uh, Marion Maddox, the researcher from Macquarie University, wrote a wonderful book called Taking God to School. And when I read that, it resonated deeply with me because, as I said, I'd, I'd spent 20 years working in Christian private school education. And I can tell you, many of those Christian schools took their Christian mission as being of more importance than their educational mission to teach the state-mandated syllabus. And that's why you have Christian schools who will fire or fail to hire gay teachers because they've got that exemption under anti-discrimination law, even though they're in receipt of state funding to run their schools. You've got Christian schools who are secretly kind of creationists and who will poo-poo the state-mandated syllabus to teach that the earth is millions or billions of years old, but instead teach young earth creationism. Wow. I remember going to educa Christian education conferences where the speaker would say, our mission is a mission of proselytisation to our school communities. And it wasn't so much about the pedagogy or teaching well. I'm sure there are very many dedicated teachers. I was one of them for many years. But, you know, the idea that your Christian mission was dominant over your educational mission yeah. just didn't ring. It, it, it's, it's, it's wrong. That's interesting in terms of paper covers rock and civil. <laughs> so you can discriminate even though you're in receipt of funding. That's true. So there is an exemption in Australian discrimination law that says that a, a religiously based employer, a school or a church or a religious charity, can uh, discriminate against uh, an LGBT member of their student body or their staff without explaining or apologising. It is a blanket exemption they have and it's ostensibly so that they can preserve the religious character of their organisations and ensure that the people that are in those organisations, as a teacher for example, uphold the values of that school. But I know of plenty of teachers who didn't want to rock the boat, kept their sexuality as a deeply personal matter and when their sexuality was exposed cruelly, were fired as a result. And they did nothing to dishonour their employers. And I think, again, in the opinion of, of, of many people in the broader community, that that's offensive. Now, in Australia at this time, there is a push for there to be a new bill introduced to Parliament that enshrines religious freedoms even more than they are currently enshrined and to entrench the ability for religious organisations to discriminate against people. And they say that it's a shield to protect their religious belief, but really it's also a sword. And I, I can't see this legislation as, as doing any good when it's used as a sword to discriminate against people. Well, that sounds from what you're saying, that if they're allowed to keep the money and do what they want, then they'll just get licensed to do anything they see fit. Yes, and is that too simple? Of a no, that, that's not an oversimplification. I think that any organisation that's in receipt of state money should be required to abide by the same rules that apply to the rest of Australian society. I mean, if any other employment context, a person was drawn into the boss's office and sacked for being gay, there would be enormous recrimination. But if it happens in a Christian school, then there is no recourse one says I'm religious and I can do what I want. Well, there's a carve out in anti in, in Australian discrimination law that gives uh, religiously based employers uh, this pass to to fire or fail to hire people based on 
their sexuality and not based on the competence with which they do their job and the their right to keep their private life private. Yeah. I don't know that many gay teachers working in Christian schools want to fly the flag and, and be uh, very reactionary in that sense. And I, I think we're past the era where people can't be thought of as good Christians and committed to a same-sex relationship at the same time. That strikes, I think, many people as a very hateful anachronism. It's it's just always this one particular thing. Don't worry about the drunkards or the gamblers or the immoral or all those other people that shall not see the kingdom. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, the the kind of people that Jesus used to associate with just doesn't come up in conversation, does it? This had, I mean, I can, you know, hear now talking to you, obviously the principles of democracy and all that goes with it as things that you strongly believe in and this had the impact on you that you started looking outside. Well, look, I'm, I'm involved in politics myself. I'm a local government councillor in the Hawkesbury and uh, I sit as the chairman of another local government organisation and to the very limited extent that I have a public profile or that I'm a public figure, I feel a certain obligation to speak from my life experience and to speak from the things that I've seen in Hillsong churches over many, many decades, and to say, you know, I think I think this isn't right. They have influence in the national debate that they're not entitled to. I think that they take taxation concession from, from the government that they're not entitled to. I think that they hold views that are offensive even to other Christians, let alone to people who don't feel like they have Often to other a dog yeah. in that fight, and that they, through their labelling, purport to speak for the Christian community this religious freedoms legislation, even before it was tabled, because they preemptively said, well, we haven't read it and we don't know what's in it, but it's bound not to go far enough. We prefer it to go even further. This is before anybody had seen it, I might add. That lived reality of myself and many other people just wasn't reflected in their final report. In fact, many people would say that the laws that are there already go too far. You don't want to be bolstering them. You want to ensure that the sensibilities of many Australians are are better reflected in the sense that if you receive government money, you can't go around sacking your gay teachers. You know, we we need protection from Israel Folau. Israel Folau doesn't need protection from us. Yeah. So then this all becomes more and more apparent to you. How do you go about the process of stepping away? If a person's committed to personal integrity and to the pursuit of truth and to growth then they have to, from time to time, question whether the the setting that they're in allows them to be completely honest. So if a person is in a charismatic or Pentecostal or Hillsong type church, and you're young and you're enthusiastic and you're sewn into that, there is some germ of doubt, isn't there? You've seen something in the conduct of your own leaders or ministers that makes you sceptical that they are deserving of all of that adulation and special treatment. And when you've given of your own time and heart and money to give to the missionary work or the building fund, is it really for the noble purpose that you were told? Or is it to some degree for the uh, aggrandization of the, the ministers of that church so that they can be standing next to the mayor or the local MP or the prime minister and say, there we are, making a difference on the national stage. It's actually more about them than it is about you. And they're playing upon your good nature, your warm-heartedness, your, your, you know, the upbringing that you had that says that you should be devoted to something bigger, that you should give back to your community, that you should try and help people that are worse off. There are better ways than to be in a Hillsong-affiliated church, you would be surprised how harshly they think about you or how harshly they judge you when you're not around. What do you mean by that? I've spoken to people who were uh, high up in the leadership of these denominations at times. You know, the kinds of stories that come out about tears and recrimination and, and harsh words towards people that are just trying to give of their time and their heart towards. Don't be under any delusion about what these people actually think about you. That's what I'm saying. So happiness and fulfilment 
and finding a, a good point of equilibrium in my life has been a process of letting go and being very selective about what or who I give up about. And it's difficult to teach that lesson to a young person who is full of zeal for the cause. As you grow older, I can promise you it's not a question of becoming, you know, an apostate or becoming cynical or becoming bitter. It's about becoming wiser. There's a thing about the Pentecostal churches that says a leader would say opinion is cheap, but wisdom will grow the church. So you've got to understand all of the psychological tricks that are being employed in just a simple phrase. What you're effectively doing is you're saying, well, anything that you say that opposes the will of the minister or the vision of that church is merely opinion. And anything that's in line with the minister's edicts is wisdom. So you're being gaslighted into suppressing your critical thinking skills and into suppressing your innate sense of questioning about what's right and wrong. And you're being told that criticism is dissent. Criticism is bad. And people often confuse conformity with unity. The church always makes this appeal for unity. But in fact, what they're talking about is conformity. And the church is all about conformity. You go to Hillsong on any given Sunday and see how all of the nice young lasses dress the same way, have their hair the same way, have their makeup the same way, have similar dentition, uh, how all of the young men all want to be like the figure that they see up there on the stage. And again, it's the most understandable thing in the world. But as you grow a little older, what is it that Bertrand Russell used to say? He says, fools and fanatics are always so sure of themselves, <laughs> but wiser men so full of doubts. That's so true. You see it everywhere. You didn't tell me how you left that church. I left it in 2004. I'd given 16 years of my life. But what I, what I will say, the thing about leaving is this. You're never free of the yearning to believe. To return to a simpler, a simpler time of your life where things were black and white where things were easy, where you were part of a family that would accept you and embrace you with conditions and that you you were free of all of these nagging doubts about the more complex issues that life throws you, about how relationships fail and how the world is imperfect and how governments may or may not do good and how there are many people who will assert that they have the one true faith, but they can't all be right. And when you lose that, it's like leaving Eden. And you confront a more complex world that can be more rewarding, but you feel like you've lost something. It's an amputation. Mm. And it's, it causes a grief. Leaving your faith and leaving a fellowship causes a kind of... It is a post-traumatic stress. The trauma will revisit you when you least expect it. So recently, when these revelations about, you know, Brian Houston being charged criminally and, and, and covering up somebody else's pedophilia, I'm triggered by that. We all are. It makes me feel anxious. It makes me grieve all over again mm. for the fact that I once gave my adulation to these people and wanted to emulate who they were and their character. There's a wonderful cartoon the, the acolyte sitting at the feet of the of the guru and and he says look I've, I've come to sit at your feet because i've long respected and admired you i regard you as a saint and a guru i want to learn from you and understand your wisdom and in the next panel he says and as time passes i shall begin to see through you and your weaknesses and your fallacies and i'll go disappointed with you for being merely human and in the next panel then I shall take advantage of what you have taught me and I'll be strengthened by it and I'll use it to rise above you and be embarrassed that I ever took you seriously. And in the last panel, and using mockery, I will distance myself from you until eventually I shall forget that you ever existed. That has been my journey. What did you take away from there? What? Here's the thing. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to leave behind your sense of commitment to your community. 
to being devoted to something bigger than you, to wanting to give back and to help those who are less fortunate than you. So it worked itself out in a variety of different ways. I went into teaching rather than preaching. Okay. I sank myself into voluntary work. I went into politics, which is a form of civic service. And I am more fulfilled and I'm, I have more integrity and more dignity in outworking those desires in those ways than I ever did in the church. Because if you're doing the right thing and you're giving to the poor because you're looking for a reward in heaven, you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. The Jewish philosopher Mammonoides centuries ago said that there was a kind of a hierarchy of giving. The lowest form of giving was giving where the person who was getting the benefit knew who it came from. But the highest form of giving was where a person gives anonymously. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. They're constants of human nature, that these are humans with human failings. Yeah, Mm. yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. And this has been a long time coming. You know, can I say in parting that, you know, being able to tell your story isn't something that many people can do until years and years and years yeah. have elapsed. Yeah. It's taken a lot of time for the, the, the temptation to be bitter about this to be washed out of you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Show on. Thank you so much to Nathan for choosing this show to talk about this very important topic. I did ask him before we started the interview whether he was willing to have a knock on the door and he didn't flinch. And as I said last episode, there's so much more to Nathan than these two episodes could ever cover. So make sure you look him up. You spell Zempronio, Z for the Americans, A-M-P-R-O-G-N-O. He's been a social commentator on the intersection of faith and politics for many years, and I think you'll find him really interesting. You can find him on Facebook, and his website is counsellorzampronio.info. Nathan's also worked at KIFS, as he discussed, and you can find them, the Cult Information and Family Support Network, at kifs.org.au. Now, of course, if any of these episodes have been distressing to you, especially with that content focusing on Frank last episode, please reach out, reach out to one of us or to somebody you trust. And if you think that you have information that the police need to hear, then of course, make sure you report it to New South Wales Police. I believe it's the Hills District Command that's running the case. So get in touch with them. If you need support to report to police, again, please reach out to one of us. Thank you again for joining us for this conversation. By this time next week, we should be talking about the new podcast, Reading Hill Song. So stay tuned to social media, all those kind of places, and you'll see the news there. So the Frank Houston audio is now going to be attached. I've put a longer ending for the song, so hopefully you can switch off in time or pull over or whatever you need to do if you don't want to hear his voice but here's an edited version of a 2004 speech that Frank Houston gave just months before he died. Thanks for all your support, all the messages and feedback it's just so appreciated. Keep it coming please and we'll be talking soon. Bye. Oh, well, isn't that nice? Nice to be wanted. You know, when you get older, 
You know, uh, sometimes uh, people don't want you anymore. They think you're too old. And, uh, you know, when, 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 when you face reality, it's not my fault I'm 82 or whatever it is I am. I can't, I can't remember now whether I'm 82 or 81. Or I know I'm in my 80s. And as long as I know that much, I know I'm not insane. <laughs> I know I'm not 70 and I'm not 60 and I'm not 20 anymore. But I am about 82. You can work it out for yourself. I was born on the 22nd of April in 1922. Now somebody can tell me how old I am. But I can't be bothered working it out. You've got it already. 82. You're very clever. And uh, it's lovely. Lovely to be here again. I, this is not the first time I've been in this church. I don't know. I've been here quite a bit over the years. And uh, preached here. Uh, but like I said, it's not my fault. Uh, I'm in my 80s. And uh, <coughs> last uh, May, on, uh, on the, uh, the 30th of May, I think it was, uh, uh, my wife went to be with the Lord, as you probably know. And uh, how many months is that? That's about three or four months, isn't it? And, uh, and so on. And so I think everybody thought, poor old Frank. That'll be the end of him, you know, because Hazel was absolutely everything to him. God's got a purpose for your life. And if I didn't say anything else this morning, that's an important thing to say. God has got a purpose for your life. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I haven't time to get to you all. And the little boy back there. Two little boys. One bigger than the other. But God's got a purpose for their life. A couple of little kids up there. And a sweet little girl with a white ribbon. Or is it pink? In my old age, I can't tell what color it is. But I think it's white. Is that white? Yeah. There you are. I'm not as blind as I thought I was. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the lady back there with brown eyes. Woo! Glory to God, isn't that amazing? There's nothing wrong with my eyes. Now they've gone pink. <laughs> you know, but you know, how, how wonderful it is, isn't it? You know, when you know Jesus, Say, when I know Jesus. Now the question is, do you know him? When you know Jesus, that makes a big difference. Now people were saying, poor old Frank, Hazel's gone to be with the Lord. Now he's alone. But what they didn't realize, I wasn't alone at all. This uh, curly-headed little young man here, sitting here, uh, lounge, you need a lounge chair. That's not comfortable enough, is it? You know, not comfortable enough. You want, you, you want to get yourself, bring yourself a nice lounge chair to church. Fantastic. But what a fantastic young fellow he is. Curly hair, sort of, good looking. And it's not your fault you're good looking. So thank God you are. How old are you, son? Ten. How old are you? Eight. Ten, eight. I'm 82, but it's 82. I wonder what you look like when you're 82. No hair, whole wrinkled face. 82. Do you think you might live till you're 82? What do you say? Probably. I think. Probably. What about you? Do you think you live till you're 82? I wonder what you look like then. Tall, fat, big. Strong, healthy, happy. Ah, when is your birthday? Third of May. What's the date now? Twelfth of You had your birthday. Oh, you can't have another one until next year now. <laughs> when is your birthday? No, I'm just going to go down and uh, pray for you very quickly. And uh, so don't get impatient. I'm not going to take long. All right. What's your name? What? Can you say it louder? Oh, Matt, dear. Isn't that? I got a, I got a, uh, a, a little, my son. I got my son. His son's name Matthew. Lord Jesus, bless him, Matthew, in the name of Jesus. 
What's your name? Nathan. I've got a nephew called Nathan. Nathan. He might end up being a young preacher, a young evangelist, preaching the gospel. He wouldn't be the hell old he is now. Fourteen. Well, many a boy of fourteen has had a revival. Which reminds me, I, I had a I had a boy in my church in New Zealand, in County New Zealand, years and years ago. And he was fourteen. This is what reminds me when I think of him. And his name was Donald Hennessy. What an Irish name. Donald Hennessy. We used to call him Don. Don Hennessy. He was 14 years of age. And I was pastoring a church. And all we had in the congregation was about 28 people. And this boy, Don, had a revival in his heart. And as a result of that, you wouldn't believe what happened. 